Hey everyone, welcome to today's video and today I'm going to be going over the reasons why it's so important to have a holistic view when it comes to design and you shouldn't just purely be looking at the raw numbers. So you might be wondering what the hell I'm talking about. As a young engineer, have you ever just been asked by your manager or a senior to just design a beam? So here's an example. I want you to design a beam. It's got a span of five meters, got a dead load of 20 and a live load of 10. And that's it. Just design a steel beam, happy days. So that's pretty easy, right? Steel beam, smash it out, one minute. Give them a steel beam design, say it's a 300 deep UB section. 102 mil wide flange, simple. Didn't take you very long. Manager's happy, right? Right? Okay, so what if your manager asks you what your deflection limits were? And you say, well, I've designed it to span with 250 for the total load and span with 360 for the live load. Sounds good enough, right? Well, no. What if I told you now that what you're actually supporting is a wall? Is that gonna change anything? What if the wall you find out is now 400 mil thick? How does that change? Well, you've just designed a beam which has only got 100 mil bearing and it needs to support something which is 400 thick. So physically, the dimensions just don't work. So what are you can propose? Well, you've froze the beam. How about a wider beam like a UC? Well, that's pretty big, really heavy, hard to install. Okay, well, what about the same beam, but you just add a top plate to it, welded to it? Well, it works physically. You might, you can spec, spec a 400 wide top plate, but then you've got to think about the bending of the plate. So that's another thing you need to consider. What I'd probably do, given this situation, is probably design um, a beam, but spec it twice. So you have two beams side by side, and you probably want to fix them together so that one beam doesn't deflect more than the other, and they both work in, in the same way. Well, what about deflections? And you might have seen the the limit, which is span over 500 for brittle partitions, which is all well and good. But what if the wall isn't a new wall? It's an existing wall. Does that span over 500 still apply? Well, I'd say no, because a span over 500 is a 10 mil deflection, which in my eyes is too much. Because if you think about it, a normal mortar bed is 10 mil. Can you imagine or what, you know, what 10 mil deflection is gonna look like? It's gonna be a pretty big crack in all your masonry joints, which is not really what you want. So if I was designing it to support a existing wall, I'd be limiting the deflection to about five mil. So this is what happens when you consider everything else around, not just the numbers. You know, what is it supporting? How is it going to be built? Can they actually get the beam on site? Does it need a splice? Is it too long? All these things matter and it's going to determine whether or not your solution is crap or if it actually works. So you always want to be putting yourself in the position of the contractor or the builder. How are you actually going to smash this hole out? How are you going to support it? What are you going to do? Well smash a wall through you need to prop the floor or prop whatever is above it then you need to think how are you going to lift this beam into that opening what are you going to need you need pad stones bearings all these things you need to think about and this could change everything about your design i'll give another example so i see a lot of graduates who will be asked to design a retaining wall now a retaining wall design might be slightly trickier than a steel beam design but let's say your manager or your senior says, can you design me a retaining wall? It's got a surcharge of 10, and it's got a retained height of two meters. Sound about right? Oh, and it also gives you an allowable bearing pressure of 200 kPa. So you've got plenty of plenty of stuff to work with, right? You can smash that out, 10 minutes, and you've got a design. So that's what's gonna happen if you don't think about the site constraints or what's around the retaining wall. What is it retaining? Is it retaining virgin fill, virgin soil, you know? Can you excavate behind it? What is behind the retaining wall? Are you gonna be able to import engineered fill? Say for example, the road behind is only two meters behind the retaining wall. So obviously you can't dig or undermine that road or whatever it is. You don't have the space to put a really big, nice heel, which makes the retaining wall really efficient. You're gonna have to put a bigger toe in front of it and reduce the heel size so that your excavation doesn't undermine whatever it is behind the wall. So you have to think about all these things. Do you have space to do it? Is it going to be concrete? Could be masonry, could be something else. You need to ask these questions. Rightly or wrongly, the manager probably should have given you the story, the background behind whatever it is you're designing. 
But if they don't, you should still be asking the question. And if you're not asking the question, you should find out. Probably have a look at drawings first, and then if you can't find the right answer, go ahead and ask your manager. Maybe the manager actually expects you to go and do this fact finding, find out exactly what it is. You know, he might have given you some forces and some value, but you should be looking beyond just the numbers and look around everything else which can impact the design. You really need to be finding out as much information as you can before you actually start crunching the numbers. Otherwise, you really will just be wasting everyone's time and it can be quite embarrassing. For some viewers here, this might be really, really obvious. But, but seriously, for some junior engineers, it really isn't. And they might just think they're going down the right route by doing exactly what their manager says. And this might not be your fault, but you should be sort of pragmatic and inquisitive. Ask the questions, find out exactly what it is you're doing before you start crunching the numbers. Hopefully you've taken something from this video and if you haven't, sorry for wasting your time, but I feel that this is quite important for junior engineers. Anyways, please remember to like and subscribe and see you next time. Cheers.